Uh, good evening and welcome to tonight's um, artist talk, uh, an exhibit that is sponsored by the Arts Project. I'm Pam Bramble, Professor of Art and Art History and also the Coordinating Director of the Arts Project. Um, this talk is just one of many uh, arts and humanities events that is open to the public this semester here at UConn Carrington. Before I start, um, I have been asked to do a little bit of administrative work. Um, uh, I'm wondering if you would all be so kind as to put your name on here so that we can have a sense of how many people come and you know, who attends our, our uh, events. If you're interested in being added to our mailing list, there's room here for you to put your, your email address on there as well, but obviously that's, that's optional. So sure. Thank you very much. Um, and also, I would like to invite everybody to remain after Banji's discussion talk um, for a, a reception and to continue our conversation uh, with one another. Um, so tonight, naturalist and artist Banji Getzinger Nicholas will discuss her work, her development as a visual artist, and her sources of creativity, which many of you um, are aware of and can see here right, right behind me. But first, um, I would like to share a few words with you about the artist project. Exploring the creative project uh, process is one of the central tenets of the art project. And to that end, our exhibits are curated with an eye towards presenting to the public and to the academic community here at UConn Torrington Exhibitions that help us become aware and understand not just what the artist is seeing, but how the artist sees. And our artist talks are an integral part of this endeavor, and they give us all an opportunity to have a discussion with the artist based on the very things that are right before us. The curatorial effort behind all our exhibits has been to engage the viewer in looking at the creative process that individual and solitary path that each artist takes as they proceed from the initial concept through to the completed work of art, and to create exhibits that reveal just a bit of the unique way in which each artist sees the world. Previous exhibitors have included digital narrative artist Karen LaFleur, whose exhibit Underlines gave us a glimpse at foundational stages and current artworks in progress. Elizabeth McDonald's show of paintings reflected the project's interest in how process can be both subject and theme. The beautiful and sensitive <coughs> photographs and poems of Sister Joanne Iannotti were exhibited side by side to suggest to us that these two forms of expression, photography and the writing of poetry, need not illustrate nor explain one another but rather provide the artist a dual avenue into the investigation of the world. Artist Tommy Simpson's exhibit of sketchbook pages and preliminary stage drawings of some of his fantastic furniture sculpture let us participate in the development of a work of art. And most recently, ceramicist Reggie DeLarm's historically based yellowware pottery was on view here, along with the tools and the materials of the potter's trade. This coming fall, we are exhibiting the work of Daniel Mailer in both the Brick Wall Exhibition Space and here in the Whitson Gallery. And then in the spring, we have two exhibits uh, planned. Uh, one is an exhibit of Peace Corps posters that have been designed by uh, students in a, a course that's taught by Professor Deibler, uh, it's an illustration class. And uh, in conjunction with the show, one of our faculty members, uh, Tom Hogan, will discuss his experience in the Peace Corps. And running concurrent with the Peace Corps poster exhibit uh, in the Whitson Gallery, we will be featuring the work of Marlo Shammy in the Brick Wall space. So as you can see, the exhibits that we put on and that we are planning to put on, both in the Brick Wall exhibition space <coughs> and here in the Whitson Gallery, combine, combine finished works of art alongside sketches, source material, preliminary drawings, perhaps a various stage of a work of art, and sometimes unfinished work as well. And as in the case of Banji's exhibition, the artist materials. As the curator of our exhibits, my goal is to create exhibits that show us what can be behind completed drawings, finished paintings, the framed photograph, the sculpture on the base. Works of art are often seen as statements, as it were, by the artist. 
They are a culmination of an artist's thoughts, their perspectives, their understanding, their inquiries, even their feelings about a particular subject or topic. Exhibiting source material and sketches and unfinished work and artist material can therefore be seen as a dialogue that we can have, a dialogue that shows us the dialogue that the artist has with him or herself. Banshee. <laughs> Banshee's uh, exhibit Silver Linings, literal and metaphorical, is concerned with both. Beautifully and skillfully and fully nurtured drawings and paintings, and of course, the objects from the natural world that she loves so much. The butterflies and the shells, nests, the eggs, even the egg yolks, and nature's dried pigments. Nature is, for her, magic. A few biographical notes. Banshee's early childhood was spent in Northwest Connecticut. Her family, parents and four siblings alike, were all creative individuals. Her love and respect for nature can also be traced to this very early period in her life. This passion can be seen in her work as both an artist and as a naturalist. Banshee graduated from Mattituck Community College with an Associate of Arts degree in 1985. In 2001, she received her Bachelor of General Studies degree from UConn, <laughs> focusing on biology and art. <laughs> she graduated cum laude while all along rehabilitating many birds along the way. The following year, in 2002, Banji was awarded a Martha Boshan Porter Grant. This is a grant given to individuals in training, studying, or practicing in the arts established by the photographer Martha Porter. Quite an honor. And two years later, in June of 2004, she received certificates in botanical illustration and natural science illustration from the New York Botanical Garden. Banji has been the recipient of numerous awards and has exhibited her work <coughs> through New England since 1991, as well as in New York, Seattle, Washington, and Minneapolis, Minnesota. Currently, Banji maintains a studio in Warren, Connecticut, where she also gives private lessons. In addition, she teaches at the Washington Art Association, the New York Botanical Garden, the Brookfield Craft Center. Her medium of choice, egg tempera and silver ones. And so, Banji gets in her pickles. <laughs> different to hear yourself described by someone I know. else. <laughs> um, unlike Pam, I forgot my notes. Um, but, but I remember most of what I was going to say, and I hope, really, that this will be more of a dialogue than me speaking by myself. I, most, actually, all of the work in the Brickwell Gallery and in here, with the exception of one piece, are either an egg tempera painting or a silver point drawing. These two mediums are the oldest, two of the oldest mediums used by artists and were in common use up until about the 1500s when silver point lost ground to graphite as a drawing medium and Egg tempera was superseded by oil painting, which I think artists found much easier to use. It required a lot less preparation. It has been my experience in teaching silver point demonstrations and giving egg tempera workshops that very few contemporary artists or lover of the art, lovers of the arts know very much about egg tempera or silver point. So I thought I would begin by explaining some, a little bit about how I became interested in these mediums. Please feel free to interrupt me anytime you want. Is that a request? <laughs> <laughs> um, I first became interested in, in um, egg tempera, kind of going through the back door. I had been taking classes at the Washington Art Association for several years in oil painting. And I was interested in adding gilding to my paintings. I thought that to put some gold in the borders would be something I might like. So I began researching gilding and 
the farther I went with that and the more beautiful paintings I looked at, the more I realized that egg tempera and silver and, and um, gilding have a long history of going back centuries to um, Byzantine icons and medieval religious paintings and Renaissance paintings. I, I became as interested in the paint as I started off being in the gold. Mm. I love the smoothness of the surface and the amazing amount of detail that the artists were able to capture using egg tempera. A detail, as I suppose it's fairly obvious, I, I love detail. <laughs> I do not see the big picture. I am focused in on, on the details. So, realizing that I loved egg tempera, I also realized that I loved the imagery, which surprised me a little bit, but that I loved all the cherubs floating down from heaven and, and the arches that <coughs> framed the important people in the, or characters in the painting, and all the haloed saints and the incredible stylized wings of the angels. It was, and, and the colors, the beautiful colors in, of the egg tempera paint. So then I started looking into contemporary egg tempera painting and found a number of artists that I was, that I just, their work spoke to me once again, usually in the detail. I knew about, of course, Andrew Wyatt, but I also learned about Robert Vickery, who does beautiful, well, he died, but he did beautifully detailed work. Um, Fred Wessel, who is kind of local to this area. Um, George Tooker, there were any number of them, but it was really the work of Ku Shadler that completely captured me and made me an egg tempera convert. She seemed to combine contemporary figures, animals, and paint, painted them in a contemporary way, not stylized like the older paintings. But she maintained enough of that medieval imagery with arches and certain bits of architecture that I felt like she maintained this historical connection to the beginnings, the roots of the medium, while making it contemporary at the same time. So I am a convert, but I need a teacher. And it quickly became obvious that I was not going to find a teacher locally for egg tempera. So I did what almost every egg tempera artist I now know did, which is I started buying books and collecting magazine articles. And fortunately, at that time, I was beginning to have use of the, the internet on a regular basis. I probably started off dial-up, but things improved <laughs> as I went along. And this was around 2000, and I, I just started painting. I just started following the directions as closely as I could understand them and, and painting. And I looked at some of those paintings today. Um, they're, they're very special to me. They're not bad paintings, but they're not good egg tempera paintings. I realize now how much I had to learn about the qualities of the different pigments and the tempering of the paint in order to acquire this unique luminosity that an egg tempera painting can, can give. So this brings me to about 2001. I'm not going to take it year by year, don't worry. Um, in, two in 2002, as Pam mentioned, I received the grant and decided to take the classes at the Botanical Garden in New York and get certificates in natural science illustration and botanical illustration and to condense this all into a two-year period, which was, I think, how long the money would last. And I wanted to get them all get them all accomplished. So I had finished all the coursework by um, almost the spring of 2004 when I saw an offering in the courses of a silver point class. I didn't know what silver point was. 
I like the sound of it. I think it's a I think it's a pretty word. And I and I think I had some idea that that silver point drawings were probably very delicate and detailed. So it was only a three day class and I went and I took it and it was it was such a fit, it was it was like my egg tempera conversion. I finished the classes at the botanical garden, got the certificates and started off now as a egg tempera painter and silver point artist. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Any questions so far? <laughs> um, you can let's see. I can we can talk I can talk about technique, which I thought I would do next. Do you, did, did you have any awareness of egg tempera before? I mean, you said Andrew Wyeth. I didn't even realize he painted an egg. I thought that was oil. Mm -hmm. Or did both? Did he did both. both. Yeah. Christina's world is egg tempera, oh. right, Pam? <laughs> After I was misquoted in, in oh, right. That's right. as saying that um, the Mona oh, Lisa was an egg tempera painting, oh, I want to be really careful. <laughs> Just curious, egg tempera, how is egg tempera different from tempera? And also, with silver point, do you actually draw with a piece of silver? You actually draw with a piece okay. of silver, and it shines. Onto, well, I'll talk about that. And actually, I kind of forgot about everything that was here. This I just wrote a book about silver point drawing um, that describes the same technique, the way I do it when I present a silver point demonstration. And I brought a piece of paper that's been treated so that it can be drawn on, so you can practice on it if you want to see what it's like. So it has to be treated. You can't just draw on the regular exactly. piece of paper. Did, what, did I answer your question? Yeah. OK. A three-day workshop, and, and who was the teacher, and, and what were they doing? What, it they, was the only time they... It was an introductory course, or... I mean, it's a, it was, I don't know. It was the only time they ever offered the course, and the, the, I, I can't think of his name now. His first name was Scott. Um, I could get it for you. He, he's a teacher in Minnesota, and I think he just came to the Botanical Garden to do this course. And to tell you the truth, it was a three-day course, but it meant driving to the Bronx three days in a row. Halfway through the second day, I was done. I got it. I understood. You have to make a sufficiently abrasive ground on either a piece of paper, or usually on paper. And once you have this abrasive ground and you have a little piece of silver wire in a holder, you're good to go. And so, and there's, I've also done a lot of experimentation with the silver point too. In fact, I'll talk about that technique first because it's the easy, easier. It's easier to understand. Um, the book describes the process of doing silver point drawing on paper. A heavy paper is good because the ground that you put on it is has to be painted on. It is either just push. Okay. This is um, titanium white gouache that can be found at any art supply store. This is white casein. Either of these mixed with a little bit of a little bit of water so that it's about the consistency of um, not quite heavy cream, but maybe half and half, <laughs> and then painted on a water media paper, a piece of. Um, at least 140 pound hot press watercolor paper is perfect. Um, so you just paint, paint it on one or two layers, coats. Try not. It was a bug. <laughs> um, try not to try to not to let the brush marks show. Try to use a wide, soft brush so that so that you don't have create ridges with the casing or the or the um, gouache. And as soon as it's dry, you can start drawing on it. Do you prepare the shells the same way? No. The shells? I completely forgot to even, even when I was doing notes, I completely forgot about the shells. The shells are my newest passion. And um, so I'll just go aside for a minute. 
last October, we were going to Maine for a week, and I was trying to decide which art supplies to bring, and I always bring way, way, way too much. Yeah. Bring things I'll never have time to use, sort of like books. And I remembered it, I had seen a shell that was painted at the New Britain Museum. It was the most beautiful oyster shell painted by a woman named Tabitha Vevers. And the idea of using a shell as a palette was very appealing to me. And then the next thing was I remembered my cousin, who is a um, geologist, telling me that the way, in, if they're in the field and they're testing, they find something and they want to know what kind of metal it is, they scrape it on the inside of a shell and they can tell by the color of the mark that's made what kind of metals are in, in the rock that they picked up. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, there are going to be plenty of insides of shells in Maine, and so maybe I'll just bring my silver point and see how that goes. I was so excited when I took this old shell that had been on a two by four in one of the bedrooms and been there for years, and I took it and I started to draw a tree inside it with my silver point. And the, the silver, the shine of the silver and the, and the shape of the shell was just, it, it was very exciting. It, it had a, a downside too because I realized that not every shell will let you do that. Some shells will and some shells won't, and I, and I think it has something to do with how long they've been naturally aged outside, kicked around by the ocean and sand. But then, fortunately, one of my students taught me that if you have a shell that doesn't want to respond well to the silver point in some places where the knacker is um, thicker than, than the rest of it, that you can I dip my silver point in a little bit of vinegar. And just that little bit of vinegar seems to degrade the surface of the shell mm -hmm. enough that just before it dries, I'm able to leave a nice dark silver mark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the preparation for silver point is pretty simple. And as I said, that's how you do it on paper. Egg tempera has has to be done. Egg tempera was traditionally done on a rigid panel that had been that had received from anywhere from six to nine coats of traditional gesso, which is rabbit a combination in the right proportions of rabbit skin glue and some inner white substance that is either calcium carbonate or calcium sulfate. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. It's it can be plaster of Paris. It can be marble dust. It can be a, a variety of things. I think if you live in Italy, it's some kind of one kind of chalk, and if you live in France, it's another kind. So, as long as it is this inert white substance mixed with the right amount of rabbit skin glue, and then the okay. So this is this is why tempera painters were in such a hurry to switch to oil painting. <laughs> <laughs> Because most egg tempera painters I know have at least experienced making your own panels. I do it about once a year. It's just, just a humbling thing that I, I do to remind me of the origins of the craft. This is the part of it that's more craft than it is art. Because it takes a full four days to get a panel ready to be painted. So it's not a spontaneous medium. In, in a lot of ways, it's not a spontaneous medium, but the first day, you have to coat the panel with rabbit skin glue to seal all the surfaces and let that dry overnight. The next day, you mix up your white powder with the rabbit skin glue, and you have to let that sit and settle so that all of the white powder is absorbed and and all the little bubbles in it get to work their way out because if they don't, you'll have pinholes, which are will ruin a panel for use. If it, if these tiny, tiny little pinholes that don't show up right away until you go to paint on them and you can't fill them with paint. You go around trying to fill all these little pinholes and it just doesn't work. So then the third day, and you want to do as many panels as you can because obviously you don't want to go through this every time you need a, a panel. The third day, you, you heat the rabbit skin glue and gesso 
white stuff in a double boiler and paint on your layers. First layer in one direction, when it's dry to the touch, second layer, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. And you also have to do it on the back to keep the panel from warping if it's larger than a certain size. So that could be another whole day too, doing the back. And then the fourth day, you can, you can sand them. And the sanding goes on forever. Um, I have, I have panels that I actually will pass these around. The, the, oh, the good, I didn't tell you the good news about this. You can buy them too. <laughs> <laughs> but only from one place that I know of. There used to be two, and there are a couple of other places that make highly specialized icon panels, which are really made for icon painters. They have a they have a curved surface and they are, I think, usually made out of maple or some wood that's been slowly dried to be perfect. The, this is good that there is still a place we can buy these. They, unfortunately, you buy them in standard sizes. So if you want to work with different sizes, you're going to make your own panels. But I'll, So this, it's marked on the back that that's commercial. So if you want to pass this around. These two I made myself. <laughs> and I'm going to pass them both because this one is sanded and I want you to go ahead and touch it because I, I can clean it with denatured alcohol. But so really feel how beautifully smooth the sanding is. This one is unsanded and they're marked on the back. Not that you're going to have any problem figuring out which is which. <coughs> is that, uh, is that awesome? It's so uh, wonderful. The um this is unsanded. Well, if you value four days worth of time, they're practically free. Well, suppose, <laughs> yeah. suppose you wanted to say a, a nine It would be about eight dollars. Oh, okay. And then shipping. A nine by twelve. About eight dollars, seven or eight dollars. Seven. Uh, now this is a different color. You know, I did say It'll be the same lighter. when it's sanded. But I mean, this is whiter than the. Than the Mine are whiter. Yeah. yeah. I um, I don't know I don't know what they use in the commercial process, but I do know that this company uses rabbit skin glue and and they might use a different type of chalk. I use marble dust. I'm I like. I like things that shine. I like things that are fine. You use masks. I do wear masks. Yeah. Yeah. And if you paint on a commercial gesso board, it won't hold the paint for a long time. Is that commercial? The ampersand a company called Ampersand does produce a a gesso panel. They and they say that it's appropriate for egg tempera painting. I have a student who used it, and to me, it seemed like his paint he had to apply his paint very thick to keep it from sliding around. And also the panel is less, it's the ampersand panel is only about an eighth of an inch thick and part of it is the substrate. So it can't possibly have the number of coatings of gesso. And also it doesn't use rabbit skin glue for a binder, it uses an acrylic binder. And I'm, I, I don't like acrylics, sorry babe. <laughs> <laughs> Angie, is this a is this a, like a mason or like a composite board? Or it's is called medium density fiber board. It's a ideally what I would be using would be untempered masonite, but you, untempered masonite is very hard to find. If you go talk to people in lumber lumber yards about it, they give you blank looks. <laughs> because most masonite has resins and glues and things in it that you really don't want to use for a tempera painting. So when when I'm ready to paint on that, where's my oh, I crack an egg. That's the best part. That's the most fun part. And if I were doing a painting demonstration, I would I would actually show you how you crack the egg. Get the, I get the yolk in my hand, and then I roll. The yolk is in its own little membrane. And you roll it gently on a paper towel until all of the white is dried off of it. And then, on a good day, 
you can pinch the membrane and hold the egg yolk suspended in the air. And when you prick it, the yolk falls into your cup and none of the membrane gets into your paint. Wow. <laughs> so you've got egg yolk. That one's closed. No, it's okay. Um, so I have a little container with egg yolk and then I use these little white porcelain things to make my paint in and put kind of a visually equal amount of dry pigment with the same amount of egg yolk and then I mix them together until most of the pigment has egg yolk around it and then add a little bit of water and a little bit more water. You want you want the paint to be fairly thin. You actually want it to be quite thin. And then begin to the, the adding the egg to the pigment is called tempering. That, so that's the question about the other tempera paint. It's it's actually essentially gouache. The binder is gum arabic, where the <coughs> binder for egg tempera is egg yolk. And it's the egg yolk and the correct tempering of the pigments that gives that special luminosity to the surface of an egg temper painting. Angie, how do you get white then? With a golden egg yolk, how do you? Um, when you first mix your white, it has a yellowish cast to it that goes away when it dries. In fact, I have also to pass around, these are, these are two rejects. Tried to throw them out, but my husband has a habit of taking them out of the trash <laughs> by the weight. Um, this is a reject because it's really badly pinholed, and I don't know if you saw I, the the one that I did. I started it all over again after days of work. Um, the the finished one is out in the brick wall gallery, but I'll pass this around. You can go ahead and touch this too. And but what I want you to see, especially in the white. Well, the whole thing is see the way the way the egg yolk, the luminosity of the, that you get from the egg yolk in the paint. Well, I think it's fascinating it how is. much this is a craft. It that <coughs> that when I was thinking about when when those artists back in the 1500s abandoned silver point and egg tempera, I think I I see it as being as silver point and egg tempera are part craft. They start off being craft before they are art. And I think that probably a lot of those artists had apprentices who did a lot of the craft and that they probably started off doing that themselves mm -hmm. and then eventually graduated to, to being the artist and not the craftsman. Um, this is another reject for different reasons, but this one, uh, this, this is silver point on panel. Mm. It, was only a matter of time before I would realize that these egg tempera panels that I worked on were going to be abrasive enough to take silver too. And the best thing about doing a silver point on panel instead of paper is that when I'm done, it doesn't need a mat and it doesn't need glass because glass reflects lights in the room and lights from the windows and it and I want to see the shine of the silver. Mm. But that's gold paint. Well, well that's, no, yeah, that's actually 24 karat gold, too. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Wow. But it's painted. Thank you. I painted Thank that, you. yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Oh, the, oh, the paint yeah. that I make? Is it one day? Um, that's it? With, with back in the 1500s and prior to that, it was only good the day you painted it because they didn't have refrigeration. I will, if I have made paint and I have enough good colors that I want to use the next day, these little dishes that I use stack and I close them in a container and I will keep them over one night and then that, that's it. Then I, I make my own. One of the name one of the names for egg tempera years ago was Il Putrido. Angie, <laughs> 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 while you're working with it, I mean it, it's fascinating to me because because it is a water soluble um, medium. 
you know, how, how do you keep it, I mean, do you keep it from drying out? It dries like, immediately. Yeah, it dries, oh, immediately. as soon as you put it down, it dries. It dries, it dries faster than any other medium. What about in the dish? Do you have to keep adding water? In the, in the dish, you do have to keep adding water. To, well, it depends. If, if you're going to be painting all day long, you will be adding water uh -huh. to your paint. Um, the way Ku Shadler paints, she puts her, her paint, her she paints on a flat surface, and she's constantly misting her paints. Oh. Oh. Because they really do, this is one of the beautiful things about it, is the first stroke, and also, it is described by Daniel Thompson, who wrote one of the definitive books about egg tempera painting. I, in my opinion, Ku Shadler wrote the other. It's described as being a pencil-like, a drawing medium. Even though it's paint, you're kind of drawing with paint because you can't have a loaded brush, you can't have wet areas. You use, you, as soon as you load your brush, you scrape it off on the side of the container, and then I wipe it on a paper towel, not hard, but just lightly. And then it has just enough paint to keep going. It'll give me, I don't know, 15 or 20 brush strokes. But there, it's a pencil-like <clears throat> movement of strokes. There are no broad brush strokes. And there's no, no spontaneity here either. This is, it's a medium for control freaks. Or <laughs> um, the work that I did at the Botanical Garden actually turned out to be something like an incredible two-year apprenticeship for, for Egg Temper and Silver Point because so much of the drawing, and there was a great deal of drawing, and also a lot of, I think, graphic arts techniques, probably. Uh, the one, uh, before I, this, these are, I'm going to show you drawings that I just did for a series of three silver point drawings of a cyclamen in my studio. So before I ever even started working on the on the silver point panel, I did this drawing. The second one, I had pretty much figured it out. So I was getting the shapes for the second one. And with the third, I need all that stuff too. I was really just focused on the on the flowers. Is this Point no, this is, this is pencil. pencil. This is what I do before I before I ever even start working on a panel. Then, when I have my drawing done, I put tracing paper on it and trace the whole drawing from my sketchbook. And then, if I'm unhappy with any part of the composition, when I, when I put it down against the uh, panel, then I cut pieces out and I move them around to places that I think I might like them better. So I have lots of little pieces of these. Um, I was apparently unhappy with the curve that I had on a flower, so I had to change that. And, and this is how I learned to work with all this tracing paper preparation. Then. When I've got my tracing paper the way I want it, I, this is like carbon paper, only I make it myself. It's mm -hmm. tracing paper, and I take a pigment close to the thing that I'm going to be usually painting, not so the point. And the way I make this is take a piece of tracing paper, put some pigment in a container, pour some denatured alcohol on top of it, mix it up, and paint it across the tracing paper and the pigment sticks. And so then I use it and I transfer my laboriously copied drawing. I use that and transfer it to my egg temper panel or silver point panel. I have a strange question for you. Okay. When you draw on the shells, is it like chalk on a blackboard? A little bit. <laughs> because it's, a, it's such a shiny, squeaky surface? Um, and also because to some well, extent, is this one open, Pam? Does it actually squeak? Uh, no, but it can be. It's a silver point squeaks. 
when you do silver point on, on a prepared paper, it can squeak. And when you have a whole room full of people doing it at once, it can be very squeaky. <laughs> <laughs> I took the book out too. Um, oh, thanks. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll show you this. This is, this is um, a plain piece of paper. This is a silver point stylus that I made. If I do like that, nothing happens. I hope I have the right one. This one is supposed to have casing, uh, a coat of casing on it. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. What is casing? Ca oh, God. Casing. I don't know. I don't have a clue. It comes in that way, <laughs> too. Every time I go to research something like casing, I've done it two or three times, I wind up so deep in chemistry that I'm completely confused. It makes no sense to me at all. So you want, want to play, pass, make some marks and pass it along. <coughs> I, can see it, but I can remember going and not being able to find it anymore. You can get anything online, but oh, most, yeah. most art supply stores have casing, I think. But when it's really beautiful, it's not, it's, it's not really... You, ha you can only do silver point by making little lines, lots and lots of little lines, and you make them softly and you build them up. But it's really when you have an area of tone that you, that you get to see that beautiful shine. Yeah. Okay, I got everything. Does the silver point ever smudge? Um, if you do it on, oh, it can. Like so, graphite. Silver point and egg tempera are both, if you research them, they are both referred to as unforgiving. <laughs> The lines are supposed to be good. You can erase silver point on paper, but when you erase the silver, you're also pulling up some of the ground, so you can't go back in and draw on it again. Hmm. So I'll pass this fish around so you can see him shine in his shell. Um, and, and what what is this? What it's sort just of silver. It's a is it a low grade silver or no, it's sterling silver. It's sterling silver. It's dead yeah, soft sterling, sterling silver. silver. And yes. <laughs> I'm going to take this out because the thing that I want you to notice about this is this is the the two things I love about silver plane. The way it shines and the way it tarnishes. And if you look right in here in this darkest sphere, you can see where you can see where this one has started to tarnish. Do you answer my question? Can you see it right in there? Tarnishing is something that silver point artists want. Hmm. Some wow. people put um, liver of liver of sulfate in liver with it because that tends to sulfur. So that okay, apparently sulfurous things. I mean, oh. One time I, I burned a whole thing of eggs that I was making hard boiled eggs and, I, and at first I'm like, oh, why do I do this all the time? And then I thought, I wonder if I have any silver point I could put in this air. And <laughs> ran up and got a couple of dry drawings and just to see. As long as I had this stinky kitchen full of burned eggs, I thought I might get some of my silver point drawings to tarnish. <laughs> So then, do they more. do they get darker with age? Do, do the when you start out, does the the actual the, the darkness of the lines does it, does it deepen? Um, no, it just starts to tarnish. Okay. It's not really. It, it doesn't. It actually, I suppose, it lightens if anything because it takes on a kind of a warm brownish glow. And people who do silver point, the Mary's the only other person I know here who does it. You'll notice that if, you, if you're working one week with silver point, the next week when you start to work, even though you, don't, you didn't think your, your work had tarnished, you realize when you start putting down new lines that your old lines had already begun to tarnish. Hmm. Yeah. But it keeps oh. it showing because, I mean, if it's like uh -huh. the silver jewelry or something else that tarnishes, it doesn't shine once it gets black and... Well, I, I think that the silver point, the layers of silver are so thin that I don't think, you know, when you have like a silver spoon or something, yeah. that, that tarnish can go very deep, and I think that's probably why it gets black. Yeah. But I think when you have such a thin layer to begin with, the tarnish can't go that far. I don't know. 
but that's what I think. And, and on the example that's going around with the circles, mm -hmm. you put a lot more on the left circle, a lot more silver. Mm -hmm. That was an exercise that was in the book for how to tone a sphere Yeah, with silver point. Was that done stippled? No, none of it is stippled. You really have to, you really have to get, it's just little lines, just yeah. like egg tempera painting. It's just lots and lots and lots of little lines built up, built up, built up, layers and layers and layers. And people say that I must be very patient, but in fact, to me, it is, it's, it's a meditative, happy place. I don't feel like I'm being patient at all. Hmm. Right. Well, Getting back to egg tempera, now when you create a painting, obviously uh, these are egg tempers here. Mm -hmm. How do you, when you blend, when you have to blend and create um, modeling, say on a, like the meadow here, and it goes mm -hmm. from the light green to the dark green, and there, there's yellows, and then, you know, uh, do you do that on the surface, or do you do that, do you bl can you blend? You can't blend. Not on the surface. You can only overlap. And you overlap, and then the under layers come through. Mm -hmm. okay. Some places in an egg tempera painting have a hundred layers or more. Wow. It's just layer, 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 layer. To bring it up to the okay, because uh -huh. I'm looking at the sky and how it, you know, it goes from along the horizon, it's very white, and then it comes gets to a very dark blue, and that's just layers. It is layers. I, there's there's a trick there that I learned from Crew Shadler, which is really expensive makeup sponges. Oh, oh gee. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can sponge on egg tempera too. Some people like George Tooker, he his brush strokes are part of the beauty of his paint. He can there's no his blending is done by the brush strokes, and you see the brush strokes, but you're still just completely captivated by the way they blend. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I tend to, I love the really smooth surfaces, so if I'm not patient enough to do it with a brush, some of these have been done with a brush. The, the what I call Butterfly Sunday, that was done with a brush. Mm -hmm. um, but the sponge, is, the sponge is very nice, so I, I do use those too. What did you use to do the um, the nest with the tall grasses? This uh, the top right hand. Yeah. That one. Mm -hmm. That's a tempera. Uh, what did you did you use a brush or a sponge? Oh, that's all. That's all brushed. I actually wanted that background to look like that, so it was layers of white and blue, and um, there's some raw umber in there too. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I like that kind of lively background too. That's a diff It's different from the smooth graded wash. It is. It's wonderful. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Angie, how many days would a painting like that take you to finish? A, pa a painting takes at least three weeks. Wow. Do you ever work on more than one painting? I like, I'm happiest when I have at least two or three other things going because it's nice to be able to put a painting aside and get some distance on it, let it dry, work on something else. I find that I come back to it sometimes with new ideas. Definitely being able to look at it shows me where there are things I might want to correct. And the silver points, how long do you usually spend on Same thing. Silver <coughs> point. Silver point drawing takes a really long time. Um, maybe not quite as long as an egg temper painting, but, um, and I've gotten to the point with my eyes that I have to do all my silver point under magnification. I just can't see to get the detail I want with my naked eye. <clears throat> so uh, I'm looking at your work, and so each, even before the painting has begun, you have it all figured out. How you yeah. have the, yes. the, the yes. you know the layout, the the, the whole yes. format, and you have it all. You have to. You do all your problem solving before you start yeah. putting down the paint because the paint. You know, paint can give you problems too. Like if you decide to change the composition and, and you want to, can you just sponge it off? No. <laughs> <laughs> you can scrape it off. Sometimes I've scraped off areas with a with a palette knife, but it's hard to get back to you know the, the places where you didn't scrape to blend into those places when, when it's multiple layers. It's hard to capture an evenness there. Yeah. Um, we did have to when I I had Chris Shadler come and do 
a week-long workshop in my studio in 2009. It was one of the best experiences of my life, and she had us spend a whole day fixing mistakes. We would have to we would have to wreck something so that so that we could fix it. So there are little tricks, but it's better to it's better to plan it out in advance because it is very time consuming. So is it? I, I gather it's difficult or impossible to paint over something with a tempera. Is that true? You can paint over, you can layer lighter colors on top of yeah, darks, but if something go away. You can, it's hard to make something go away. <laughs> 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 Which is why when I when I do the tracing paper in, in the beginning, it's why I try to be really aware of the composition at that point. And if there's anything I want to move around a little bit, I want to do it when I can cut it out of tracing paper and, and tape it a new place before I get to the actual painting part. How many people did you have in that class when she came to? <laughs> there were um, 11 students in Ku. Wow. There were 10 people. One woman came from Texas. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. Well, most of the artists that you know, for instance, what do they paint with the most? Acrylic, oil, or soap and oil? Well, except <laughs> Most um, my students paint with Faith uses acrylic. Richard uses gouache. Mary does gouache. Um, Roxana does colored pencil. So people and my sister is an incredible oil painter. Which is the one that would be the most easy to correct? I think Anne would. Well, I think I think. Acrylic because Faith will be working on a painting and she had a painting that that I liked and she said, well, I just don't like that chair there. I'm going to put that chair over here. <laughs> and she and, and then another time there was a mountain and it, we she moved the mountain <laughs> and that was with acrylic. So um, I thought that was it. I wasn't sure. Yeah, I don't colored pencils hard to you can't cover things up too well or move them around. Now, when you have a board, like a painting that you don't like anymore, can you restore that board, or is that, I mean, could you sand it? Sometimes. Sometimes I can sand it down and use it for silver point. Oh, okay. But um, you couldn't use it for Remember the one I gave you with the blue jay on it? Yeah. Yeah, that was, I couldn't use that anymore for painting. Because you sand it too far? Um, I'd sand it at one place right <laughs> down to the wood mm -hmm. underneath. What type of lighting do you use inside? I, I have two um, daylight lamps, full spectrum lights, mm -hmm. that attach to either side of my um, drawing table. And I have them so that I can move them around, but I have both of them on when I'm, when I'm working. Okay. And one of them has this magnifier on a swing arm, which <laughs> is very important to me. Mm -hmm. Lately, and it is the official daylight lamp. One, one, yes, yes, they are. Okay. One, actually, one is an art light, and the other is a daylight. Do you brand? Find, I have art light lamps, and I found I was working with oil, and the next morning I was working in the evening, and um, on the sky, and um, and I looked at it the next morning, and my colors were way off. Oh, and that's with the art lights. Uh huh. And plus, I also have full spectrum bulbs too, uh, that I use for, um, you know, side lighting. Uh huh. And somebody told me about the um, the other lamps, but the daylight. The daylight. Yeah. Lamps. But I, I'm just a little unsure about that. Are you happy with that? I, I, I think it, it. I think you have to really try out the bulb because I, I did get. Um, a s s lamp on a stand, mm -hmm. you know, on an aluminum stand that, that I was going to use for um, photography. Photography, mm -hmm. and it had what they call a full spectrum bulb, and I the light was terrible. Mm -hmm. It wasn't bright at all. It was it, it, I don't know. It was kind of orangey. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't really know that much about bulbs. Okay. Thank you. How how in your work do you relate craft? How I love both parts.
parts of them, which I think is why I love these two mediums. Uh, is that what you mean? I mean, I enjoy the craft part of it. Yes. Almost as much as I enjoy the painting part. So she brought a couple of copies so that we could add them to the exhibit, but as you can see, it just went out, so I'm sure if you it's, want to it's, um, it. it's available on Amazon. It's at Hickory Stick in Washington. It's at the House of Books in Kent. So the House of Angie. The House of Angie. <laughs> <The House> of <laughs> Angie. <laughs> well, thank you all, and, and, and please stay for, for a while longer. Um, we can have to continue the conversation. Not that it was all that formal to begin with, but in a more casual conversational way.